Hello, I'm going to talk to you about something called non-destructive testing, or NDT. And I want you to walk away with this idea that you can use the principles of NDT to become a better entrepreneur. And for those of you who aren't entrepreneurs, you may be and you just don't know it yet. What I'm going to share might help you take your great idea and give you the extra push to go for it. Maybe you're being held back because you feel you need a mountain of money to get started, that you might not get it right the first time. The principles of NDT I share with you will show you that not getting it right the first time is not only okay, it's expected. And that getting it right the first time should rarely be your goal. Non-destructive testing is when you want to see how something might break or fail in a real circumstance. But you don't really want to break it just to find out if it would. For instance, this egg here, I've heard it rumored, that someone in a Toronto Science Center successfully support, someone was successfully supported by an unbroken egg. And I'd like to know whether this egg can support me standing on it. We could set up an experiment where I place the egg, maybe here, then I weigh myself to know how much weight I'm putting on the egg, and then I stand on it. And that sounds great, but what if eggs were deer, like a deer and precious? And maybe destroying this egg was not an outcome that I wanted to have. It does it sound a little bit like our entrepreneur? who may want to start a new project or a business, but isn't okay with the risk of being unsuccessful. Right, so for this egg here, you've uh, already come up with some thoughts on testing the weight they can hold without storing it, right? So here's something that comes to me. I know a little bit about this egg. It has a thin, hard shell inside. It's filled with the yolk. That the yolk is watery and flexible. And before the egg breaks, the liquid inside is going to squish around, and the egg shape will bend a little. Maybe if I had a really good magnifying glass, I could peer into the microscopic fibers that make up the shell of the egg, and I could see whether the individual fibers were bending or breaking as I pressed on the egg more and more. And I might be able to come up with a method, maybe a little pressure strap and a gauge around the middle, that indicate how much the circumference has stretched. And I can match up that stretch amount to the breaking of the fibers, or if I'm willing to risk a few eggs to refine the technique, I could get a correlation between the maximum stretch in the waist it won't be perfect, but what maximum stretch I can have before the egg reached its breaking point. And that I could create a whole system for testing this and other eggs without breaking them is the essence of non-destructive testing. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you a story about web van. It's a bit of a contrast. It's an example of destructive testing. Web van was a company in 1996 that thought people were going to buy their groceries online rather than in physical stores. By mobilizing a team of trucks throughout the country, they were going to give you your groceries right to your door. Now, at the time, this was a really big vision, and big vision needs big money. So they went out and raised $1.2 billion. And what they did is they went out and built major super stores, major distribution centers in the US. They bought a fleet of trucks, they took 20-year leases on the buildings, they put the latest conveyor belt technology that would auto-pick groceries. They really built a phenomenal system. It turns out that five years after they launched, they were only doing 50,000 orders per month, which was a fraction of where they needed to be. And what happened is that you had these very competent entrepreneurs, people that had previously founded Borders Bookstore and had run Accenture Consulting with thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of employees. They were sitting across from each other saying, oh my God, what have we done? We've spent almost a billion dollars and created a business where the market might not actually want it. it. It simply wasn't ready for it. This is what I call a destructive test, and Webvan filed for bankruptcy in 2001. So much money of their money was spent in the preparation for their venture that they couldn't go back to the drawing board. They spent an unreasonably large amount of money to find out such a fundamental flaw, so large that it would be very hard to pick themselves up, raise another billion dollars, readjust the cannons, and do it again. Okay, that's what I would call a destructive test. Uh, let's look at a non-destructive test uh, by a great NDT company, Google. You may not know that because of hist the history of the evolution of the products, the links in the Google search website and the links in the Google email website were a different color. And Google wanted to find out whether they could make the two link colors the same. And so which color should they use? It's an interesting question to me because I'm not particularly aware of my color preference for things that I click on on the web. One link was lightly greenish-blue, and the other was a bit purer blue. 
And what do you guys think? Do you think there would be an effect? Do you think this change in the color would affect the amount of money the company would make? And maybe we get a hands up for the people who think a green link might be superior. Okay, well, you guys, you guys are pretty good here, because I'll give it away. Uh, Google is, they're a very non-destructive company when it comes to their testing. And you'll see them bring out changes as a test at, at, all the time. And these changes might be things like Instant Search, which they just brought out, or Google Wave, and they're quick to measure and act on the data they collect. Because billions of dollars are made on Google Search and billions of dollars are made on Google Email, both of them rely on the links to be clicked to make all that money, Google was loath to make a change to their whole site that was going to reduce the reven revenue even if it was just by a fraction. So what they did is they set up a very sophisticated test. They used 41 shades of blue. They included the two shades from the links that they wanted to test and many shades in between. And they ran those shades on both properties, and they looked at Google search to see whether the change made any effect on the number of people that clicked the links. And they did the same thing on Google Mail, and they found a variety of responses. No matter whether you were on Google Mail or on the Google website, if the link was bluer, you were more likely to click it. So by doing this simple, non-destructive test, a small portion of Google users saw a greener link than a bluer one, and they clicked less things than the people that saw blue, and Google analyzed those 41 different cases and decided that the bluest of blues was the most productive way for them to move forward. So they made the change, and now you'll see throughout Google, everything that they do is the bluest blue. So relative cost to Google here is pretty much zero, and it's a remarkable study, and you'll see more about this in the future because it's such an interesting case. Now, the purpose of non-destructive testing is to look at your idea, your business, or your product, and say, even though I believe so much in my product, that I'm risking my reputation, my time, my money, and my investment, that there is a possibility for failure. And not just one possibility, but many possibilities. It's being able to say, at some point, this system will break, no matter how great our idea, no matter how great the machine, at some point, in some environment, it'll give way. And we do ourselves a benefit by thinking through these failure cases, and it's more often than not that I'll have someone come to me with a business idea, and they'll say, uh, Jonathan, I've got this great idea. It's fantastic. Uh, I can't wait to see the success. It's so great. And what's going on in my head, and it sounds a bit like a wet blanket from here, is in what ways might this fail? And if you're a typical uh, two guys in a garage entrepreneur, uh, and you ask them if, uh, in what ways might it fail, you'll probably hear a, this can't fail. Uh, not only is that statistically unlikely, because nine out of 10 new technology businesses do fail, but it leaves them very little opportunity to proactively look at those failure modes, identify them, and figure out the test they should be running. So what I really want to know is, how can I go into the future and engage with my target market and then take that knowledge and act on it in the present day? I need a time machine, I need a DeLorean. So the most successful entrepreneurs that I see today are actively doing this. They are actively going into the market, and they're making changes and seeing how the market responds before finding the best next steps to take. We can look at the online gaming space. Uh, there's this hugely popular game in Facebook called Farmville, and it constantly offers you new things. They, offer, they may offer something to me that they don't offer to my friend or to my coworkers, and they will only change their game after they see a certain number of people positively respond to the change. Whether it's a color, a change in pricing, or a new gameplay element, by doing that, they've become a very powerful, very aggressive business because they're so actively inquisitive and responsive to their marketplace. They're doing that because it gives them resilience to failing. Every day, they bring out a dozen new potential product ideas that totally bomb in order to locate the one that is successful. And they do it in little, non-destructive ways. Farmville, by the way, it's made by a three-year-old company with a current valuation of $4 billion. So this is great for companies with a massive amount of customers. But what if you have none? And I've been building products for the internet for the past 15 years. I've been doing it for clients of mine, and I've been doing it for myself. Unfortunately, what I found is that when I've brought out my own products, I've brought some real dogs to the market. And often, more times than not, and no one wanted to use them once I brought them there. So what I did is I started trying to get a clear no from the market as fast as possible. These have become my non-destructive tests, and I now look for them in every business opportunity. Here's an example. I had just created a company for sending invoices online, and it was a complete flop. 
And what I realized is, even though we had an incredibly sophisticated product, I couldn't get anyone to give me their credit card. And the few people that I could, I'd spent much more in advertising to get that customer than they were ever going to pay me back by the use of my service. So a lot of the effort that went into that product was building a robust billing system for credit cards. But we had a fundamental problem that not enough people were willing to give us the credit cards in the first place. So instead, when we built our next product, we said, let's build the product. Let's focus on all the things we can to impact the product, but not the billing system. In fact, we won't even build the billing system. And it sounds kind of insane, because to build a product, to make money off of it, uh, you, you probably would want a billing system, some way of charging people. But that's what we did. And the whole company became this test. And the test for the company was, can we get enough people to give up their credit cards, thinking that they would be billed, and get enough of these people so that we had actually had a lucrative business without building the billing system? Now, it turns out for this company, we were able to do something amazing. We were able to spend money on advertising. We got people to the product. They, they used the product. They loved the product. They gave us their credit card. And then they stayed on the product until we had enough people where we were making good money each month. We were, we were potentially making good money each month. <laughs> we sat down and we said, our tests are showing us that this really is a viable product, and we should make the investment into building the billing system, and we sat down and we did it. So we look back at the project, which is now a thriving company, and we've tallied up how much money we lost in the months that we didn't bill our customers. And it's really a small amount compared to the benefits we gained by reducing our risk, if it had been a failure, you know, we had no 20-year leases, and it's small compared to how we're able to spend our funds on other areas, like we brought out an iPhone application, and uh, which turned out to be a real winner for the company. So I'm fortunate that, I, that it happened to be a successful venture, but I was also able to use my funds to the best effort possible, because I was able to establish a richer product, a better product, with better marketing strategies, and I was only able to realize that because I've got a closet filled with skeletons of businesses that have great billing systems and, they don't, and no credit cards to bill. <laughs> so let me give you another example. On the internet, we have this great thing. If someone comes to your website, I can, to my website, I can put a fork in the road right on the homepage. As far as that visitor is concerned, it can be a different website for every other visitor. It can be subtle, like what Google did with the links, or it could be drastically different. You might ask, why do I want to do that? Well, because if I want to appeal to the biggest market available to me, I might not know it until I start to go out to the market with my product, and then I'll really know what the market wants. For instance, in my hometown, Santa Barbara, we, California, we might need an, a great Irish pub, or we might need a great sports bar. Uh, if I were to open up a bar, I have to choose beforehand, right? I'm either opening up a traditional Irish pub or a modern sports bar. And people that walk in the door, they're either going to my Irish pub or my sports bar. Because I have all this concrete signage. I've got seating and uniforms and menus and decorations and everything about the bar that I've invested that makes people understand what my concept is. On the internet, if I were opening up the equivalent, I could open up both simultaneously and see how many people opt for each choice before spending money on any of the concrete stuff. Because all you get on the internet is the graphics, the look and feel of the site, of what it might be. And you get the marketing message, you get the advertising information. So what I do now is I look for opportunities where I can open up both businesses. For instance, if I want to sell specialized, specialist books and I want to sell comics, and I don't know which is going to be the best niche for the market, but I have a passion for selling something that's readable, what I'll do is I'll open two of them at the same time. And Rather than buying a bunch of inventory, like uh, special books and comics, uh, I'll build minimal test sites. And I'll drive people to go through my entire funnel. They'll see my ad, they'll click my ad, they'll come to my web page. I'll ask for information from them, and after they fill it out, I'll capture which the market has the most interest in. And then I can learn about how much it costs to get that person, how big a market is, and I can go back and completely structure my business with the knowledge that I've gained from those tests. And we can do this again and again and again. So some of you must be wondering uh, what I would do to satisfy my customers who thought that they were buying comics and books from me. And my challenge to you is that there are ways of doing that respectfully. respectfully. And a great entrepreneur will, make, will have a bag of tricks to help make that happen. And you can think about it for Google Wave, which was recently decommissioned. And they invited millions of people to use the service, only to shut it down a year later. So what a modern business can do today, and what I encourage, is to think about your business going backwards. Think, what are those final steps to buy-in that you want to see to indicate that you are onto success? And bring them forward in the process, and really get them out and test them. 
And that is truly the ultimate application of using non-destructive testing into your own business. NDT has lots of other names like market validation, minimum viable product, split testing, lean startups. All of those are the same things that have been done for years in engineering circles called non-destructive testing. And yes, it's relevant now more than ever to every business. Um, I found that out this summer as I contemplated opening an Irish pub in Southern California. And I'm out of my depth in making decisions for a pub. So I reached out on Facebook to my target market, and I created a group of loyal fans, and they gave us feedback on everything from the menu selection to what beer comes out of which taps. So what is the fantasy for every business? To open their doors, have customers waiting outside, knowing exactly what those customers want, and being able to meet their expectations. And that's the promise of NDT. Thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure sharing my ideas with you.